let's go let's do it let's do this hey what's up how you doing uh this is fairly unprepared i uh, just decided to go uh and do the video with uh very little scripting so hey let's get going uh this is the last two weeks of uh comics and as always they're brought to you by my own comic book red knight it's available at manos publishing print and digital uh you can find it there uh, a new trade a paperback is coming out soon, so I'll uh, let you know when that happens, basically, pretty much. So, hey, let's get going. And uh, let's see, this is two weeks of comics, and everything here is Marvel. Uh, I'm a little, a little kind of stuck on Marvel right now. I can't kind of get up. Well, I mean, they keep coming up with this stuff. Um, so, anyway, uh, last two weeks I picked up, let's see, what is this? Judgment Day, number six. Uh, let's see, She-Hulk, number seven. The Variants, that's a Jessica Jones miniseries. Uh, that's number four. Uh, Captain Marvel, 43. Uh, the Amazing Spider-Man, 12, or, or, or 906, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, Thunderbolts, number three. And last but not least, Moon Knight. It's an annual, uh, annual one. Even though they've had annuals for years, this is, a, this is number one. Um, you know, maybe the annuals should just call themselves by the years. This is like, you know, this is Moon Knight Annual 2022. Uh, and then, you know, next row will be the annual 2023 and so on and so forth. Not just this fake one, two shit. Uh, anyway, I'll get to that later. But hey, let's get going and talk about some stuff. Uh, I'm going to be brief uh, with this because I think I want to do a video at uh, at length uh, talk about this whole uh, mini series. This is Judgment Day, uh, and this is from Karen Gillan. And who's the art on this? Uh, the Reno Skitty. And I really enjoy this. I dare say. Um, this is the best event I've read in years, and I'm not a big fan of events, and I think uh, Marvel and DC use and depend on events too much uh, to boost sales to the point where I think it's uh, artistic detriment to their regular titles. But however, every so often one comes along that's pretty good, and this one I think is great. I really enjoyed this, uh, and this is part six, this is where everything has come uh, apart. Uh, the progenitor, the god, is winning, and he is pretty much knocked down eight billion people down to under a billion. Uh, he's been murdering left and right. Uh, the X-Men have actually resurrected Captain America, which is goes against what they normally do. They only really like uh, resurrect mutants, but uh, they bring him back, and uh, the Eternals... Uh, along with the X-Men and Avengers go into uh, the actual innards uh, in the mind of the progenitor uh, in order to stop him as Captain America and his group do what they can on the ground. And it's interesting because we get this huge, epic, gigantic fight uh, really rendered gorgeously. The art in this is fantastic, and it really does have this kind of epic end of the world feel, which, you know... Uh, just about all these events are epic end of the world stories, but this one really does have that tension to it uh, in the art. Uh, you really do feel because maybe it has a lot to do with you know you get to see cities and people suffering, and also uh, Gillen does a really nice job of catching up with these like six humans that are just random people in the world and seeing how this event affects their lives, and uh, we keep up with them, and they're kind of they kind of have a story. They kind of have a uh, character arc a as we go. And they only really have like two pages each issue. Uh, and uh, we get to see a couple of them die, a couple of them like stand up and do the right thing. Uh, and then of course we do end with uh, they're able to I don't want to give too much away on this, but they're able to sort of kind of like put the progenitor in a difficult uh, argument. And he ends up kind of like abdicating judgment on himself to uh, Ajax, who uh, created him, and she votes him down, uh, kind of rever destroying and reversing everything he did. And uh, let's see, we get some really nice, uh, we get some interesting places, like uh, some characters of the Eternals are dead. Uh, there's a new relationship between the Eternals and the mutants. Uh, the war is over. They've like apologized officially in the United Nations uh, to Storm and everything. Uh, 
the uh, Eternals are now uh, pariahs in um, in the world, and they, they, the mutants <laughs> are kind of like elevated. A lot of more people like the mutants all of a sudden, and at the same time, because the uh, their enemies, the Orchids, uh, uh, kind of helped fight the battle, they actually also became more popular. So at the same time, their enemies are also uh, well thought of. So. And then, of course, the Avengers are going, man, that was, that was fucking crazy. <laughs> um, I enjoy Captain Marvel. Uh, they, they're talking about what they should do. And one of the other characters, Starbrand, I think, suggests maybe we should, like, get a tattoo to uh, kind of, you know, memorize this, you know, kind of, like, mark the occasion. And Captain Marvel says, look, I, if I get a tattoo for every one of these, I'd be, like, I'd look like a drummer at a punk band. So, uh... Uh, that's pretty funny. And then, of course, we end with this whole new different uh, status quo for the Eternals. Now, I'm not reading the Eternals, uh, but it really does end in an interesting place as well as uh, the, uh, for the X-Men and, and the Avengers, too. Uh, so, yeah, I really thoroughly enjoy this. This story seemed to be about stuff and was telling a story, and the art, uh, art was gorgeous. Uh, I think I will talk a little bit more at length in a Manos Collection video. Uh, uh, sometime in the next month or so, uh, you know, when I get a chance to kind of sit down and reread it. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to give this five out of five RAM chips and the whole uh, miniseries I recommend. All right, speaking of cool stuff that I like, uh, She-Hulk number seven, and uh, this is from Rainbow Rowell. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I live in the city, so the city is loud. Uh, Rainbow Rowell and uh, Luca, let's see, uh, Marsika? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, just to catch up, uh, Jack of Hearts is back to life, his powers seem to be draining, and that means that he can actually be close to, to She-Hulk, uh, and they've actually becoming actually close. And last issue, they uh, started making love, and we get to see the next morning. And I gotta say, you know, sexiness has always been like a thing that uh, the She-Hulk comics and the TV show leaned into. But I gotta say, this issue, this not just this issue, but this series so far, it's probably been the sexiest I've ever seen uh, a She-Hulk story. And uh, maybe it's because um, her relationship with Jack of Hearts really does feel real. I don't know. It just has a nice, like, thing to it. And the moments are allowed to sit and kind of play out and be, like, romantic and sexy. And, yeah, I dig it. Uh, there's a small subplot uh, <laughs> involving uh, a Doom bot that believes he's Doom. And uh, I forgot. This is kind of... One of several Doombots that think that they're really Doom, kind of like hanging around the Marvel Universe. And uh, he actually has a lawsuit they, they, they want him to help with. <laughs> they want her to help with, excuse me. So we'll see if that kind of develops into like the story arc. I'm not sure where that's going. But uh, a couple of issues ago, Jen and Jack are attacked by this couple, this giant guy and his tiny girlfriend who like talks him off. And... Uh, Jen didn't really have a chance to really figure out what the hell was that about, so she's able to get back to them, check the apartment, and uh, apparently it was kind of a trap. They were always were really looking for her, uh, and she's thrown into uh, the basement, which is the basement that looks like Jack of Hearts escaped from from the beginning of the storyline, so uh, I'm very curious as to where this is going. Um, don't know who these characters are, don't know what their plan is, don't know what Jack of Hearts is, like, I mean, is he the real guy? Maybe he, uh, you know, he, this could be like a clone, an artificial being, or something like that. But anyway, I have a, fe I have a feeling this is going to have kind of a sad ending. I don't know. Just this feeling. Uh, this is 5 out of 5 Ram Chips. Excellent series so far. I really recommend picking it up. Uh, the Variants. Uh, this is a Jessica Jones uh, miniseries. It's written by Gail Simone and Phil Noto uh, doing the art. And uh, long story short, uh, the, let's see, uh, Kilgrave has apparently put some sort of, like, sleeper message in Jessica's mind uh, for her to attack her family, and he did this years ago. Uh, and he's done this a couple times with other people, too. And uh, she's kind of, like, trying to figure out how to stop it, while at the same time, these uh, par uh, variants from other realities are, like, interfering. And I am wondering, as I read this, uh like like how much of this is from from him or like is she really uh kind of running into these variants uh, 
there is this really cool moment where she has this kind of like she goes into this trance and talks to <laughs> uh, Kilgrave in her mind, and she actually was able to get Professor X to assist her. So he shows up and Bloom's very powerful. Uh, it's easy to forget because he gets his ass kicked a lot uh, physically, but it's easy to forget how scary powerful he is uh, to assist in this. And we do have this really nice, um, I won't reveal who, but one of the uh, variants is a turncoat. So uh, I guess we're kind of like reaching the end. Uh, this isn't too bad. I am a little over characters hanging out with variant characters for some story, like, you know, the Spider-Verse stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just not a fan of that type of thing, and man, we are still doing this thing. Uh, but that kind of thing, this is pretty decent. I'm going to give this a four out of five Ram Chips. Uh, not too bad, and I love Simone's uh, character work here. Uh, Captain Marvel! And uh, this is issue 43, and we are getting into the Brood. Hey, remember the Brood? They were the aliens ripoffs that... Uh, that uh, the Marvel did for like the X-Men and now Marvel owns the rights to produce uh, aliens now so I mean we really don't need the brood but uh, let's see here we go we're gonna kind of use the brood uh, this is Kelly uh, Thompson let's see Sergio uh, Davila is uh, doing the art and it starts with uh, her and Rhodey trying to have a day off uh, which is hilarious because of course they're not gonna have a day off uh, they get a call, a distress call from none other than Rogue. So shit must be bad if she's if she is calling Captain Marvel. Uh, so they instantly go to the X Men tree. By the way, they have a treehouse uh, in the middle uh, of uh, their headquarters. Is a big giant treehouse in the middle of New York City uh, right now. So uh, she comes to them and goes, hey, uh, I need you to watch this message. Uh, I think Rogue's in trouble. Is she here? Is she okay? And they're going, no, she actually took one of our jets and took off into space. So uh, she assembles a team. Uh, we got a couple of cool characters going with her, actually. This is actually like, kind of a nice team. Uh, I haven't seen Psylocke for a minute. Uh, so they take one of their jets, they head off into space and find that craft, and they find a brood looking a lot like Rogue. So... Uh, Curious to see uh, what's happening here. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen the Brood, and actually, it's kind of nice. You know, like I said, like you know, Marvel doesn't need them anymore. They got the aliens, so it's kind of nice. Like, oh, okay, cool. We're not gonna forget them. Here they are. Uh, I give it a uh, strong four out of five Ram chip. Actually, no, fuck it. Uh, I'm gonna give it five out of five Ram chips. So nice, good, uh, strong first issue. And uh, Carol's been doing a lot of like weird stuff with magic and shit like that and um, and time travel stuff. I'm actually kind of nice to see just her fighting the brood. Let's go. Uh, so five out of five. Uh, if you haven't been picking up lately, uh, this is a good time to jump back on. Hey, Amazing Spider-Man number 12. And hey, remember that Hobgoblin guy? Hey, he's back. And this is, oh, by the way, this is from Zeb Wells, John Rabina Jr. And uh, it picks up right where we well, actually, after we left off, because Hobgoblin was going to attack, uh, let's see, Kingston and uh, Norman Osborn, and then we see the after effects of the fight. Like, he slaughtered all the henchmen and beat the shit out of those guys and took off. Uh, I mean, Norman Osborn's hurt. And uh, he didn't tell Peter about this meeting. He kept it a secret. And Peter's like, hey, you know what? You're, you're redeemed. All your evil was pulled out of you. Um, uh, so I'm doing my best to trust you, <laughs> and I, it's hard to trust you when you lie to me, because you were the Green Goblin, the worst person ever, so you can imagine I'm a little, I'm a little, dis, you know, disheartened when, when you lie to me. Uh, it's a really nice scene, and he goes to, uh, Betty, uh, Betty leads, and she's worried that Ned has become the Hop Goblin again. By the way, I'm not a fan of Peter using this uh, Green Goblin uh, glider. I'm not, it just doesn't work for me. Oh, uh, but that's neither here nor there. So anyway, he goes to Ned, and he's attacked by another Hobgoblin. We have this fight, and it turns out it's Kingstead. He is actually the real deal, and he reveals, like, oh, okay, it's not just me. I actually have turned Ned Leeds into an, uh, me as well, so uh, he is also... The Hobgoblin were partners, kind of, sort of. Uh, this is kind of fun. I'm going to give it four out of five Ram Chips. Uh, 
I'm really surprised that we're getting to this reveal in the second part of the story, uh, which either makes me wonder, like, what are they doing? Or like, oh, they got a plan, they're going <laughs> to... Like, you thought this was crazy. Wait till you see what we do here. Um, but, uh, by the way, I, I love the art. The art's really nice in this issue. Um, big fan of John Romita Jr. I don't care what the internet says. I adore his work. Uh, so, four out of five. Hey, Thunderbolts! And issue three, this is from Jim Zub and uh, Nithio Diaz. And this is a pretty fun issue. I really do like this book. Uh, Let's see, Hawkeye is trying to kind of figure out how to train his new team of Thunderbolts. He sucks at it. And Monica Rambeau, who was secretly hired by uh, the mayor, Luke Cage, to kind of watch after him and sort of, I don't know, kind of ups absurd him, uh, actually. Uh, and, you know, he's kind of trying to train them, and they get a call while they're doing that. So the super apes from the old Red Ghost thing. Uh, they've like long since gotten rid of the Red Ghost, and they're now attacking a zoo. Uh, it's a typical stupid supervillain thing. Uh, this is the, the Super Apes are one of those Marvel things that I love. They, they look, you just need some villains to beat the crap out of and uh, to progress the story, and they do a great job. And it's so funny they show up, and the cops go, "Hey, don't, hey, can you back us up? We'll, we're gonna gas them." And uh, and then you can roll in and, and take them. And they're going, and Hawkeye's like, "No." <laughs> We are going to, like, do this. They get their asses kicked by the super apes, by the way. To the point where the cops, like, say fuck it and gas them. And it works. The cops actually <laughs> save the day. Uh, which is a little bit of embarrassment for them. So, because let's face it, the cops can't stop school shootings. But they can stop super apes. Uh, and... Let's see, we get this interesting moment with the, the Guts and Glory guy, who is this jokey kind of like uh, 90s parody character, and he's come out of nowhere, so he's a bit suspicious. But he has this really interesting speech he gives to both Hawkeye and Monica, telling them, you are both screwing up. Uh, like, you have no responsibility, Hawkeye, and you are, Monica, you're sitting there waiting for him to screw up, uh, and neither one of you are doing a good job leading, uh, which is... A really really cool scene so anyway uh, I'm kind of digging this story uh, I dig I always dig screwed up superhero team uh, books and so you know like the old Justice League International stuff uh, and this is currently that for me uh, I'm really digging it I'm gonna get this five out of five round chips really enjoy it if it's under your radar uh, you should probably check it out all right lastly Moon Knight uh, this is the first annual ever for Moon Knight they've never made another one uh, but yeah, getting to my point earlier, they should just call, you know, they, they do this, they like reboot the series and they give the, the book a new annual one and shit like that. And, um, they should just call the annuals by the years, you know, oh, hey, this is 2020, this is 2021, so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, here is annual one and it is a Werewolf by Night story, which, hey, what do you know? What a coincidence. <laughs> uh, let's see, Jim McKay. Uh, who does the regular series is writing this. Uh, let's see, uh, Rico Sabatini is doing the art. And uh, let's see, like Marlene from the old series, like the old 80s series shows up and her daughter's been kidnapped. Their daughter has been kidnapped because they have a kid together. And uh, Jim McKay thankfully reminds us of that. He's, she's been kidnapped by Werewolf by Night. And uh, let's see, it's because he has been forced to, uh, to kind of meet this prophecy uh, so, let's see, the idea is to lure Moon Knight in and kill him. Uh, and Moon Knight, of course, is going in. And by the way, Hunter's Moon comes on, comes in. Uh, Moon Knight brings him in as backup. And Khonshu starts talking to him. And Khonshu says, hey, you know, the best way to defeat this problem is kill the daughter. Uh, like Hunter's Moon, go do it. And we have this real nice tension of like, is he really going to kill the daughter? <laughs> uh, but no, that's not what he did. He actually kind of resists uh, what Kanchu wanted to do. And we're able to figure this out. Uh, uh, of all people, the daughter tells Moon Knight and uh, Jack Russell, the, the, the werewolf, like, you know, you don't have to do what the prophecy tells you, you know that. <laughs> you can just do whatever. <laughs> and, 
it kind of ends this uh, the the problem. Um, I really do dig this. Uh, Marlene and, and uh, their daughter are gonna gonna relocate because uh, they were at a, kind of a safe house in uh, France. Now they're gonna kind of move to another place because uh, Moon Knight uh, is apparently a very problematic person to have any kind of relationship with. Uh, so it's a really touching uh, kind of ending with uh, him and Reese kind of like uh, talking as well, kind of like trying to figure shit out. It's like, man, people don't like me. <laughs> but uh, really do uh, dig this. Uh, Jim McKay's work on Moon Knight is absolutely wonderful. If it's an annual and you think you can skip it, actually mm, uh, recommend uh, skipping it. Uh, matter of fact, it has ties to the old like 80s series, the Doug Mensch stories and stuff like that. So uh, check this out. Uh, five out of five ramp chips, as always. Uh, I think Jim McKay's uh, Moon Knight is terrific. All right. So, hey, that's the end of me. I'm over. So if you want to support me, uh, The Real Manos, you can find me on uh, like Facebook, Tumblr. Uh, I, you can support this channel uh, on uh, Patreon for just a dollar a month. Uh, you can buy Red Knight Comics in print and digital at manospublishing.com. And uh, not to mention I'm on TikTok, at Justin Cristelli. And at the moment, I'm still on Twitter. So we'll see about that. Anyway, push the button, Lindsay.